the a Road to 2016. This is a, it's a great event. Um, you know, I, I know something about this process, and I know what is entailed in running for president, and it's a, it's a very, very grueling process. Uh, Governor Johnson allowed that he was in New York this morning, woke up at 3 in the morning to get here uh, today. And, and that's the way it is day after day after day because it's a big country and it's a challenging process. So we're really grateful that he's here. It's particularly challenging if you're a third party candidate because you don't have the resources and you don't have the platform that is afforded uh, the Democratic and Republican candidates. So we're happy to, uh, uh, to provide that um, today. Um, I want to thank International House, as always, for uh, uh, working with us and providing this room and being co-host on this event. I also want to emphasize that as a tax-exempt uh, organization uh, and in the spirit of the Institute of Politics, uh, the University of Chicago does not support or oppose any candidate uh, for political office, and the IOP is providing an equal opportunity for all presidential candidates to participate in this series. So uh, we'll let you know when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are going to be here. <laughs> uh, in the best U, U Chicago tradition, we look forward to a thoughtful, rigorous discussion uh, of key issues facing our country. Um, uh, and just a couple of housekeeping notes. The governor is going to take your questions. He's going to make some remarks, and then he's going to take your questions. Uh, students will get priority for the first three questions. Please keep your questions short and to the point and make sure that they actually are questions and not speeches so they should end in a, in a question mark. Um, please remember to turn off uh, or silence your phones. Um, and uh, I, I should say that Steve Edwards, our great executive director, will be up here uh, to help uh, moderate the question and answer session. And now uh, to formally introduce our special guest is Adam Beisman. Adam is a third year in the college majoring in statistics. He is from Nashville and, and is a member of the IOP Student Advisory Board and a really active and valued member of the IOP. So I should thank you for that uh, while well, I have the opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Adam to the podium. Good afternoon, thank you for that kind introduction. Gary Johnson is a businessman, author, and politician. He began his political career in 1994 when he ran for governor of New Mexico, winning a close primary and then a three-way general election. As governor, he vetoed more bills than any other governor at the time. After winning re-election, he focused his second term on developing the school voucher program. Johnson continued his political career when he declared his candidacy for president in 2012. After an unsuccessful bid in 2012, Johnson, who has been described as fiscally conservative and socially liberal, accepted the Libertarian Party's nomination again for 2016. Just last week, the Chicago Tribune editorial board endorsed Governor Johnson for president, saying, saying every American who casts a vote for him is standing for principles and can be proud of that vote. Yes, proud of a candidate in 2016. Please join me in welcoming Governor Gary Johnson. <laughs> oh, very kind, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> very kind. So I've had some uh, overriding uh, principles in my life. One is, is if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Uh, and that means you make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And there's not a quicker way to fix mistakes than to first acknowledge them. I also think that one of the big uh, unforgivables in life is hypocrisy, uh, saying one thing and doing another. Uh, myself and Bill Weld as the Libertarian nominees for president and vice president, um, we are not hypocrites. 
I do believe uh, that my political evolution is probably going to end up to be like a lot of yours, or a lot of, for those of you that are out here. Uh, in 1971, I self-identified as a libertarian. I got this handout and read the handout, and it was what it was to be a libertarian. It said, if you believe in what you've just read, pass it on. I passed it on. I believed in what I read. Uh, at the time, uh, I was a registered Democrat. Uh, my first vote for president was uh, George McGovern uh, against uh, Nixon because of the war in Vietnam. My first libertarian vote for president was uh, Berglund against Reagan in his second term because Reagan blew the lid off of deficits and I really was concerned about deficits then. Uh, I became a registered Republican, ran for governor as a Republican, never been elected, uh, never been involved in politics prior to running for governor of New Mexico, um, and actually uh, won. Uh, but I think that the majority of people in this country um, are, have four legs to their stool. And I'm, I'm hypothesizing this, right? 60% of Americans, I think, are limited government. Um, the Constitution of the United States, a document that really is about limiting the size and scope of government. Uh, the Bill of Rights, uh, protecting minority rights against the will of the majority. Uh, I think most people believe in the Constitution of the United States. I also think that most people are socially inclusive. Um, the fact that people should be able to make choices in their own lives, period, as long as those choices don't put other people in harm's way. I also think that the majority of Americans right now are skeptical regarding our military interventions, regarding our government going in and supporting regime changes that has actually resulted in a less safe world, not a more safe world, and I also believe that um, most Americans are free market. Uh, they may not know that. Uh, we're all against crony capitalism. That's when government uh, interjects itself, picks winners and losers. Uh, and by definition, that's crony capitalism. Um, government is for sale. It doesn't have to be. It can be about equal opportunity. Uh, and as governor of New Mexico, I think I delivered on equal opportunity in spades. A lot of the bills I vetoed were bills that gave added favoritism to those that already had uh, power and influence. So free market, uh, bottom line, I think means more U.S. jobs, uh, not less U.S. jobs. I do believe in lower taxes. I believe in immigration. I think that immigration is really a good thing. We should be embracing immigration. Uh, building a wall across the border uh, is just uh, crazy. We should make it as easy as possible for somebody that wants to come into this country and work uh, to be able to get a work visa. A work visa should entail a background check and a social security card that applicable taxes get paid. Uh, socially inclusive, believing in marriage equality, that that is something constitutionally guaranteed. Abortion, how can there be a more difficult issue uh, facing any human being, whether or not to have an abortion? Well, any human being, that means the woman involved. Who but the woman involved should be making that choice? No one else other than the woman involved should be making that choice. Um, legalizing marijuana. Um, I. Um, I'm the highest, everybody gets a lot of pun out of that. <laughs> I'm the highest elected official in the United States to call for legalizing marijuana. We have the, we have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. I refuse to believe that we are any less law-abiding in this country than any other country in the world. And yet we have 2.3 million people behind bars. Uh, I think its roots are in the drug war. Uh, I think the discrimination against those of color uh, have its roots uh, in the drug war. Uh, I believe all lives matter. 
but I believe black lives matter, and they matter because there is a discrimination that is taking place. I also believe that this country has never been better, ever. We get along with each other better than ever. Uh, we communicate with one another better. Our kids are smarter than ever, and the number one law enforcement tool that we have are our smartphones. So the issue regarding Black Lives Matter, I think as a country we're going to come to grips with this uh, more effectively in a shorter amount of time than perhaps uh, we could have ever expected that to happen in the future. And then with regard to our military, uh, first, uh, I want to be absolutely clear. The President's first and foremost uh, responsibility is to keep us and our freedom safe, especially from foreign attack. If the government does nothing else, it must do that. Keeping us safe means having a military capability that is unquestionably second to none. Ronald Reagan was on to something when he spoke of peace through strength. And even in our most severe budgetary constraints, we have the resources to maintain the greatest defense on the planet. But that doesn't mean we cannot, and in fact must, reduce military spending. More about that in a second. Where the debate comes into play is what we expect our military to do. The best word to describe my approach to military interventions abroad is that I am a skeptic. As president, I would not need to be talked out of dropping bombs and sending young men and women into harm's way. Rather, I would be the president who would have to be convinced it is absolutely necessary to protect the American people or clear U.S. interests. I will be the skeptic in the room. And there's good reason for skepticism. Just look at the past 15 years. I supported going into Afghanistan after 9-11 to deal with Al-Qaeda and its Taliban hosts. We were attacked and we attacked back. But seven months after we sent our troops to Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda was scattered to the wind and the Taliban had been removed from power. Al-Qaeda was gone, but we stayed, and stayed, and stayed. We're still there. Why? We've been on every side of the conflicts in Afghanistan that have defined resolution, defied resolution for generations. A lot of you were too young to remember, but there was a time when we were fighting on the same side as Osama bin Laden against the Soviets, who learned the hard way the futility of engaging in Afghanistan's tribal wars and politics. We accomplished our mission in Afghanistan, and we should have stopped there. Today, too many lives and too many dollars later, the Taliban is returning to Afghanistan. And if we were to mount another surge, remove them, and stay there another 15 years, the same thing would happen as soon as we left. Unless and until Afghanistan takes its own destiny into its own hands. Afghanistan needs to take its own destiny into its own hands. Likewise, it is difficult, if not impossible, to identify an instance where our military interventions and regime changes in the past 15 years have improved the lives of anyone. Iraq, yes, Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. No question about it. But are the Iraqi people better off today because we decided to take him out? Are we safer here in America today because of that? No. In fact, Let's not forget that as bad as he was, Saddam was the roadblock standing in the way of Iran's rise as a real threat to the rest of the region. Removing him freed Iran to pursue its ambitions and turn its attention elsewhere. An unintended consequence for sure, 
but a real one we must admit and which we should have anticipated. And let's not forget that prior to that, prior to uh, the invasion of Iraq, Turkey was a strong and reliable NATO ally in the region. But that relationship went south in a big way when we invaded Iraq, an action Turkey opposed for its own reasons. And today, as we deal with ISIS and Syria, I think we wish we had the old Turkey and that strong alliance back in our court. As for Iraq itself, well, it is obviously a tragic mess. Saddam was horrible, but is what we replaced him with any better? Libya, same song, different verse. We use our military to help overthrow Gaddafi. Again, a bad guy, and by anyone's standards, a war criminal. But what took his place? Did we have a plan? Did we consider the potential consequences with which we are living today? I could go on, but the lesson is clear. Is it our fault that chaos has consumed nations such as Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, or that violent extremists have found homes in the wake of our, in, in, in our, wake of our interventions? No, it isn't our fault alone. We had good intentions, but we intervened with no clear vision of the outcomes and frankly, with no clear vision as to the overall U.S. interest, which should be the guiding principle. I'm a chess player. Making a move without looking ahead to your opponent's moves or even what your next move might be usually doesn't turn out well in the end. Our foreign policy, or lack of it, over the last 15 years has been a series of erratic chess moves, and the match just isn't going well. I think we need a chess player in the White House. More important, we need a policy guided by principle, not politics. The first and overriding principle is that our foreign policy and military actions must support clear U.S. interests. That seems obvious, but in recent years it has not been the case. Our interests are our lives, our property, and our freedom. They are not necessarily a desire to shape the world in our own image or to pick winners and losers in civil wars on the other side of the globe. The second principle is that we must expect and demand that other nations shoulder the responsibility for their own defense and economic well-being. We're broke. We cannot any longer subsidize the national defense and economies of other nations. Yes, we will honor our commitments to NATO and other agreements, but other countries around the world have grown too dependent upon U.S. military power. The U.S. military exists first and foremost to defend the United States and U.S. vital interests. If our actions sometimes help others, that is a useful byproduct, but it shouldn't be confused with the U.S. militaries and the U.S. governments core mission. Instead, we should expect other countries to defend themselves and their interests. If they did so, they would have greater capabilities for dealing with local problems before they became global ones. We should want more countries who share our values to be acting to defend those values, not paying us to do it for them. Today, U.S. military spending accounts roughly for one-third of the total military spending in the entire world. Our military spending exceeds the next seven largest military budgets, including Russia and China. Here at home, military spending accounts for almost half of all discretionary federal spending. U.S. taxpayers are picking up the tab for far too many others around the world, and we simply cannot afford it. Third, we must not ask our military to engage in conflicts without a clear mission and clear authorization. Among active military personnel, I am the overwhelming favorite to be the next president of the United States, and I hope it's based on what I'm saying. Let's not misuse 
our military in Afghanistan and Iraq? What were our objectives? And when could we possibly know when mission accomplished arrived? In 1999, in 1991, when President Bush ordered our troops to push Saddam and the Iraqi forces out of Kuwait, with the clear support of a broad coalition, they had a clear objective. And we achieved that objective within a matter of weeks. And the president resisted the temptation to push on to Iraq and topple Saddam Hussein. Many second guessed that decision, but it was a clear objective, a clear mission, and had a firm conclusion. That is what our military deserves, and that's what they expect. Our last two presidents have not provided that certainty to, certainty to either our military or to the American people. Rather, we've engaged in conflicts with no clue as to the outcome or the end game. Lives have been lost, hundreds of billions of dollars spent, and vacuums created that have made the world more dangerous. As for authorization, whatever happened to the constitutional notion that Congress should declare wars? The interventions that have cost us thousands of lives and trillions of dollars over the past 15 years have been conducted on the basis of authorizations passed by Congress in the aftermath of 9-11. Congress has since allowed the president to conduct executive wars while avoiding their responsibility to place a check or an approval on those wars. Yes, they have continued to fund them, but as far as casting the tough votes to drop bombs or to employ our young men and women, Congress has been AWOL. We need to honor the War Powers Act and force both Congress and the President to not only engage in war with a clear authorization from both the executive and legislative branches. As President, I will honor the War Powers Act without hiding behind dubious legal opinions from my own lawyers. If we adopt and follow these basic principles, the political sensitive idea of reducing military spending becomes realistic. We must balance the federal budget, and it is a fallacy to believe that we can do it without being smarter and more focused in our military spending. The BRAC Commission has regularly concluded that we have excess capacity in military bases of more than 20%. Military bases, more than 20% the military bases uh, that we need. We have tens of thousands of troops stationed in places like Japan and Europe. And for what purpose? We have weapons systems the military doesn't even want. And yes, we are subsidizing the national defense of too many other nations with our own troops, equipment, and deployments. With defined missions, a focus on defense rather than intervention, regime change and nation building, we can gain significant savings in military savings while in fact better securing our safety here at home. I often say we must rule the world with diplomacy and free trade. That isn't just a slogan. What is missing from our foreign policy is the idea that we must operate from a position of economic and therefore diplomatic strength. Right now, we're wringing our hands because Russia and China are imposing their wills across the globe, and we appear powerless to influence their decisions or ambitions. That would not be the case if those nations and others had no choice but to be concerned about the economic and diplomatic ramifications of their actions. Conversely, our strongest and most valuable alliances are not with nations who are dependent on our military, but rather with those nations who are dependent upon our goods, services, markets, and trade. We're foolish if we believe that we can continue to be the world's premier superpower if we do not put our financial house in order. The Soviet Union ultimately crumbled because it bankrupted, himself, bankrupted itself with flawed economic policies and overextensions of its military. No one conquered them. They crumbled from within. 
Likewise, it's absurd to believe in a global economy that we can somehow restore our economic strength and competitiveness by building walls, both physical and financial, between ourselves and competitors, as some would have us do. Show me an America with less debt, greater economic strength, and robust trade relationships across the globe, I will show you a safer, more secure America. Finally, we cannot talk about foreign policy and national defense without discussing ISIS and other extremists who would have done us harm and will do so again. Terrorism and the threat from extremists are real, but our approach to those threats must be real as well. The notion that we will someday celebrate Victory Independence Day, victory over ISIS, is both naive and misleading. It won't happen. What must and I believe will happen is that we will focus our resources on isolating the ex extremists, containing them, and starving them of the funds and support they must have to mount large-scale attacks. Tens of thousands of boots on the ground won't do it. Dropping bombs on the other side of the globe won't do it. And pretending that some military-style global war on terror will bring about a clear victory is not realistic. Protecting American lives, freedom, and property from extremists here and abroad will be a continued, continued, continuing process, combining law enforcement, gaining greater cooperation from other nations, military action where clearly appropriate and effective, and many other efforts. We may never know if and when we have won a war on terror. It simply isn't that kind of threat, and we need to deal with that reality. And we certainly won't win that war with a foreign policy that continues to contribute to chaos and vacuums of power across the globe. I so appreciate being able to come here today to speak with you all. Uh, I think that this race, uh, oftentimes uh, I am referred to as the spoiler in this race. Uh, I take great pride in the fact that among independents in this country, I am leading. And the number one political affiliation right now in this country, 50% of Americans, when they go to register to vote, are registering as independent. I'm also taking great pride in the fact that I have just tied Hillary Clinton for the lead among young people, and I've come from nowhere, really, to tie for that lead. So the portend, really, is that that may be a demographic um, that I will get more votes than anyone else. And as young people, when you talk about the future, when you talk about the future and you talk about balancing the federal budget, gosh, I'm going to get my health care, I'm going to get my retirement, but you're not going to get yours, and if you think you are, and I know you don't think that you are, most young people don't believe uh, in a future. Well, limiting the size and scope of government is creating a future for young people. It's, an, it's not an option to do nothing on so many issues that are facing this country. Thank you very, very much. Governor, thank you very much for those remarks and for your time here at the University of Chicago. As David and Adam said, we're both, um, on behalf of all of us, delighted that you made time in your campaign to be here. I want to point out that this portion of our event is designed for your questions for um, Governor Johnson. We have set up a microphone in the middle of the floor here. Um, we ask that uh, those of you who have questions line up behind that microphone. And as David said, we're looking for your questions to be short and to the point. I can already see that line filling so we can get to as many of you as possible. Um, because that line is long, I will reserve uh, any questions I have uh, just for follow-ups and clarifications. So let's begin with you. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Matt Enlow. I'm a second year student at the law school. If Donald Trump wins and your candidacy, candidacy was a contributing factor, what do you pledge to do to protect the people most hurt by the Trump White House's policies? For example, Mike Pence has called for di diverting funds from HIV AIDS patients, especially gay ones, to controversial conversion therapy that tries to turn gays straight and is almost universally condemned by mental health professionals. If the Trump White House put this policy into effect, how would you use your influence and power as a popular third party leader to protect LGBT people like you've talked about today? Well, when I found out that Pence was diverting uh, monies or trying to divert monies from uh, HIV, uh, HIV prevention to conversion therapy, I mean, to me, that's just outer space. It really is. And Mike Pence is also leaning into the drug war where everybody else is recognizing that this is, in fact, failed. Uh, and um, look, Donald Trump, uh, I think would be a horrible choice for President of the United States. But I also think that Hillary would also be a horrible choice, and I'm speaking now in the context of Hillary and the fact that there isn't anything that government can't achieve. She's talking about expanding Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, we currently have a $20 trillion national debt. Uh, I'm going to guess that it'll end up being 50, million, 50 trillion if she actually ends up serving. And I think that she has been an architect of our foreign policy. Not intentional, but the unintended consequence of her military support of regime change uh, has resulted in all those things that I talked about. But what, what would you do? What would I do? The question was, what would you do? I think if, I'm, if it was Hillary or Trump, what would you do to protect the rights of LGBT people if you were not elected? Providing a voice, um, and that's all I can do, is to provide a voice to protect those interests and have been an advocate for those interests and will continue to be an advocate for those interests. A vote for Johnson is a first vote for a whole lot of people that say that these issues matter. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Governor Gary Johnson. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so you spoke a lot about foreign policy, and you described our current foreign policy as, quote, an erratic array of chess moves. Um, however, and I ask this respectfully, do you believe that, A, your inability to correctly identify Aleppo, but then, B, your inability to name a foreign leader whom you admire, do you think that those two occasions in any way undermine your credibility? Um, actually, um, here, here's, here's the point of that, OK? is because you can dot the I's and cross the T's on names of foreign leaders or geographic locations, then that qualifies you to put the military in a situation where the military is dying. We've got military personnel that are dying. They're getting hurt. They're getting maimed for the rest of their lives. They're getting psychologically damaged for the rest of their lives because we put them in a situation of a crossfire. And in that crossfire, there are hundreds of thousands of people dying in these countries. So if that's the qualification to be president, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the names of foreign leaders and geographic locations, and because that's the quality that you have to possess, we'll just count on the military policies of this country continuing as they've been for the last 15 years going forward. As a follow-up to her question there, what do you say those, to those, though? Who have concern about your readiness and how we do approach foreign policy? Well, first of all, um, what has it now been? A, a week since I was asked to name a foreign leader that I admired? Um, I still can't come up with the name, OK? And, Having never been involved in politics before, I will tell you that I held a bunch of people in this country up on pedestals. And getting elected uh, as governor of New Mexico, I came to meet these people that I had held up on pedestals my entire life, believing that they were all about public policy, making life better in America. And what I found was, was that so many of them were empty suits that it had more to do with getting reelected as opposed to doing what was right. It had more to do with listening to polls and determining where people were on the issues rather than providing the leadership 
that was needed and is needed in this country to change the direction in this country. Something that I did as uh, governor of New Mexico at National Governors Association meetings, the Republican breakout. Stop listening to the polls. Are you, are you going to govern on the basis of polls or are you going to govern on the fact that people elected you to lead? It doesn't matter where the polls are on these issues, it's what you believe, it's what you ran on, and this country does need change. So forget about the polls, lead. Yes. All right. Hi, Governor. Thank you for coming again. Um, my question is about, you mentioned how you have high support amongst young people because they're worried about their future, um, talking about debt and retirement, but most um, millennials or young people, I think, are more worried about having a planet to live in. So my question is, what, um, how would you honor the U.S.'s commitments to the Paris Climate Treaty, and how would you get other countries to honor their commitments so we have a planet to live in uh, and we're not just worried about our retirement? Well, that, that is important. I, I support the EPA. I mean, I, support, I think government has a fundamental role to protect us against individuals, groups, corporations, foreign governments that would do us harm. I think pollution comes under the category of harm. So setting standards that we are going to comply with to reduce carbon emission, that is something that we all desire. That is something that is happening. We are 16% of the world's carbon load. Uh, the Paris Treaty uh, uh, it represents 55% of the world's carbon load. I don't want to see the United States getting out front on that uh, to the point that we lose U.S. jobs, but yes, uh, a cleaner planet. Coal as an example. Um, look, coal has been bankrupted. It's still 36% of the load, but no one is going to build a coal-fired plant when the price of natural gas is what it is. Would you be on board with a global climate tax if you're worried about the U.S. getting ahead? I looked, at, uh, I looked at the tax from the standpoint that here might be a way to actually address less carbon emission uh, and actually make it more economical to do so. The whole notion that it would uh, you know, be, be about better government, uh, be, be able to bring about a solution by doing that. In looking at it, um, in my opinion, it is far too complex for government to come up uh, with the cost uh, of, the, of, of that damage. So no, I would not support a carbon tax. We'll Thank take you. our next question, and I would just ask, because the line is long, that we keep it to one question per an individual, yes. All right, hi, Governor Johnson. Thank you for coming out today. Um, going back to your speech, you mentioned that the United States should provide international leadership through economic strength and diplomacy. Uh, you talked a lot about economic strength. Could you provide maybe some insight as to what your role would be as president in um, like buffering our international diplomacy and what strength through diplomacy means? Well, t talking about f from an economic standpoint, uh, uh, one, one bit of ad advice to all of you as, as young people, and my advice is worth exactly what you're paying for, which is nothing. But my advice to all of you as young people is to apply whatever it is that you know entrepreneurially. Uh, create your own job. Create jobs for others. I'm really excited by, the, by what I think is the future economy, the future economy, the sharing economy. I'm really, uh, I, I'm so excited about Uber. Uber everything. Eliminating the middleman allowing for you as the direct provider of goods and services to directly provide those goods and services to an end user that will pay less money, but that you will make more money. And I think we've just begun to see the tip of the iceberg regarding that. What government can do, what, what government can do is provide equal opportunity. And Having been governor of New Mexico, having vetoed as much legislation as I vetoed, I vetoed legislation that gave advantage to those that already had advantage. Crony capitalism is alive and well in this country. Crony capitalism is government picking winners and losers. The internet right now, we're on equal footing with every, every one of us are on equal footing with everybody else on the entire planet because of the internet. And I will tell you, that there's a lot of legislation pending 
that will give advantage uh, to those that already have advantage as opposed to the notion of equal opportunity. So starting off with the concept of uh, economics and entrepreneurship uh, and our ability as human beings to equally compete, I think that's where a good economy starts. What about Something that is getting piece, further though? and further away from the mark. Yeah, the diplomacy piece, though, is what he was specifically asking about. What would be your approach in foreign relations and There's establishing a, strong diplomatic ties? Uh, right now, Syria. There is only one solution to Syria, and that's being hand in hand with Russia diplomatically to solve that. There's, there is no other solution to Syria other than involving um, Russia. There is no solution uh, to North Korea without joining hands with China to achieve that uh, diplomatically. So there are a couple of examples for you. Governor, jo <coughs> Governor Johnson, first of all, thank you so much for coming here to speak to us today. Um, so what I'd like to ask about is, um, is the expansion of of wide of blanket surveillance by the government. Um, both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have been advocating for um, expanding our surveillance capabilities, not only in the U.S., but to the population, to the, just the civilians um, in our ally countries um, to, quote unquote, prevent terrorism. Um, what is your, what would you do um, regarding warrantless surveillance um, if elected president? Uh, as president, uh, I believe I can do this by executive order. I would turn the satellites away from you and I as U.S. citizens. Um, there is due process. If there is a suspected terrorist, you can go to a judge, you can get a warrant to tap that individual's information. But to me, that is not a FISA court that grants the ability of the NSA to garner a metadata collection of 110 million Verizon users. And based on what I know, uh, I would pardon Edward Snowden. Hi, Governor Johnson. Um, my name is Dylan, and I'm actually a fellow New Mexican from Albuquerque. Um, I was not old enough to remember your administration, but I do know that it was characterized by a lot of vetoes. Um, and I think in politics, um, you know, rhetoric matters, but more important than rhetoric is a record of actually getting things done. So I'm wondering if you can talk about um, whether as a governor or as a private citizen, um, your accomplishments in improving the lives of daily Americans. You know, I think the fact that, and, and I speak for myself and for Bill Weld, uh, my running mate, both of us, Republican governors, uh, elected in heavily Democrat states uh, and getting reelected by a bigger margin the second time than the first time by being fiscally conservative, over the top. We were not wallflowers. Uh, Governor Weld in 1997 uh, was nominated to be ambassador to Mexico by Bill Clinton. His nomination was blocked by Jesse Helms because he was pro-choice, he was pro-gay rights, and he was pro-medical marijuana in 1997. Bill Weld, in his first day in office, furloughed 8,000 state employees because of a budget uh, shortfall, gigantic budget shortfall in Massachusetts, and didn't receive a card or a letter uh, saying that this was a horrible thing to have happened. So this balance of being fiscally conservative, I think people genuinely appreciate good stewardship of tax dollars, coupled with being socially inclusive, coupled with having a heart and understanding the issues, understanding health care, understanding, in my opinion, that government should provide a safety net when it comes uh, to health care. I think that balance is what most people are about. I think most people are libertarians, it's just that they, that they don't know it. So in my particular case in New Mexico, the fact that I did leave office with fewer state employees, neither Bill Weld nor myself raised taxes one penny in the entire time we were in office, led a discussion nationwide on school choice and the legalization of marijuana, built 500 miles of four-lane highway uh, in New Mexico without raising taxes, reformed Medicaid in the state of New Mexico where we actually saved 25% 
uh, on Medicaid and delivered uh, better health care. Hello, Governor Johnson. My name is Kristen Bovitz. I'm a third year in the college. Thanks for being here. Uh, my question is, with rising tensions between the U.S. and Russia, and Russia and the much, much of the world, if you were elected president, what would you do to ease these tensions and better our relationship with Russia and Vladimir Putin? Well, just that, that uh, in this case, using Syria as the focal point, really, do we want to go to war? Does Russia want to go to war with the United States? No. Do we want to go to war with Russia? No. Do we want to go to war with China over the Spratly Islands? No. Do they want to go to war with us over the Spratly Islands? I don't think so. So how about those things for starting points? Thank you. Hello, Governor Johnson. Very similar to the previous question. Uh, you, you expressed your skepticism towards having troops overseas, particularly in Eastern Europe, but yet you said you would uphold our NATO agreements and things. So how, without a military presence in those areas, do you intend to uphold those agreements? Well, uh, I think it's important uh, for uh, a president that gets elected to honor all treaties and obligations. At that point, going forward, do we really want to go to war over these areas? Well, first of all, Russia knows that we have NATO alliances. They know that we will come to the aid of these countries if they are invaded, and they will not invade those countries because they know that. And we will honor those treaties and obligations. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we can have a strong national defense. In this case, we do have these treaty obligations. We will honor these treaty obligations. But it's prefaced on attack as opposed to intervention, as opposed to regime change. But how specifically do you plan to enforce that without any military presence in those areas of the world? Well, that is, well, first of all, by military presence, if you think that uh, having ten, tens of thousands of troops uh, in Europe is going to be an immediate deterrent, uh, look, the deterrent is, is that we have nuclear missiles. The deterrent is, is that we have an Air Force. The deterrent is, is that we can deploy uh, in, in a really quick and rapid uh, manner in any area of dispute. But that's a different, that's a reconfigured military that starts with a premise that if we're attacked, we're going to attack back. I say we, we have signed on to these treaties and these alliances. But it's important to honor going into this office those treaties and those alliances. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Governor Johnson. My name is Gary. I'm also from New Mexico, from Silver City. I grew up there. Um, I like your effort in preserving transparency and accountability in government. On the Joe Rogan podcast, you mentioned your, your open door after four policy. Can you speak more about that? And can you, can you speak to how you would bring that to the White House? Also, my friend Joey couldn't be here. He asked me to videotape it. Could you please say hello? <laughs> hey, Joey. Thank you so much. So as governor, I did something that no other governor did, and I did it for eight straight years. I had an open door after four policy. The third Thursday of every month, starting at four in the afternoon, I saw anyone in the state starting at four in the afternoon until 10 in the evening on five minute increments, and I did that for eight straight years. Unbelievable. <laughs> It's like ward night in a local alderman's office here in Chicago. Unbelievable the knowledge that I gained from that. Unbelievable was um, the fact that I think I was a much more effective governor being so in touch. If I may use Flint, Michigan as an example. Uh, how did the governor not know that? Well, immediately when I saw this situation, and, I'm, and I am not saying that he knew anything about it, but how would he not have known? Why didn't he have a mechanism in place? Open door after four? If I'd have blown off that first group that came in to talk about the fact that their <coughs> water was contaminated, I'd like to think I wouldn't have blown them off the first time, but Come month number two, I have to believe that there would have probably been about two dozen uh, citizens from Flint in my office telling me that, 
and I would have been on top of it immediately. So I did have a mechanism to achieve that. As President of the United States, I'm going to have um, an open door after four. I'm not sure how uh, exactly to uh, accommodate it or what the premise will be, but I'm also going to do that with my cabinet secretaries uh, also from the standpoint of uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, I think that that would be a really effective way to communicate right from the top. Are you talking about something in person or something virtually? Or no, no, this would, be in, this would be in person, but perhaps, ver I mean, <coughs> Stay, staying flexible, I, I'm, my pledge though is to uh, implement an open door after four as President of the United States. We have in, in person is a whole different thing than, than virtual. It, it, it is, it's just the reality. We have time for just a few more questions, so we'll try and get to as many of you as we can in just a little bit of time. Thank you, uh, Governor Johnson. What would be a libertarian uh, foreign policy vision uh, to do with China in the 21st century, given the existing tension in South China Sea. And in dealing with China, which of the following four domestic leaders' foreign policy visions you find most akin to what you have in mind? From left to right, uh, Jefferson, uh, Wilson, Hamilton, and Jefferson. Jackson. Je Jefferson's my favorite. Uh, all right, can you elaborate on that? Just that I, I think he was. I think he was a humble guy. Another pledge. Uh, another pledge. Uh, been to been to the home that he built. Um, um, a, a pledge that I'm making as president of the United States. I will be the most frugal president uh, to serve in your lifetimes as president of the United States. Uh, I don't think that uh, you can. Uh, I don't think you can ask others to do what you would not be willing to do yourself. And I understand Jefferson to have been very frugal. I understand Jefferson to have uh, just been an ordinary guy, considered himself such, and I certainly consider myself such. Uh, what about Hamilton? Hamilton? Uh -huh. I think that's better. Right, I, 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 I appreciate it. I just want to get to more of you before we, before we wrap. So yes, next question. Hi, briefly touching on that last point, what do you see as U.S. interests in the South China Sea and how specifically would you as president work to preserve those interests? Well, uh, I don't, we, we don't want to go to nuclear war over uninhabited rocks in the South China Sea. That, that's the way I see that. And I'm afraid that this has advanced to a certain point that I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to take over the office of president. The reality is, is that they are, dr they are doing their dredging now. They're there now. So this would require military action on our part, something that clearly we have not done and for probably a lot of good reason. But if we were to have done anything, it would have been to have uh, floated ships in that area immediately. I'm not faced with that situation. Uh, the situation that the, pre the next president will be faced with is that um, this, these will be inhabited, in my opinion, by the Chinese. Thank you. Hello, Governor Johnson. I just have a question about social security. In the Libertarian Party platform, it says that you would want to phase out Social Security and rely on private voluntary effort. I guess I'm a pessimist here, but I just can't imagine that private effort is going to take care of all the people that are in retirement, especially with the baby boomers getting close to retirement and retiring. So would you be able to explain how private voluntary effort and phasing out Social Security would be effective? Well, so I'm, I'm actually in your camp. I, I mean, there's the libertarian platform, there's the Republican platform, there's the Democrat platform. I happen to be the libertarian nominee. Um, I, I just want to fix Social Security. And by fix Social Security, just make it solvent into the future. Now, making it solvent into the future. 3030, or excuse me, 2030, it's, it's done for, it's, it's cooked, it's negative. Uh, so raising the retirement age, I think that you could have a very fair means testing. You could raise the cap on, uh, on contribution. Uh, but things have to be done to reform Social Security. I am not looking to abolish Social Security. I am looking to make it uh, solvent so that, in fact, it does exist into the future. I just pose to you that neither Donald Trump nor Hillary Clinton are proposing to do anything with regard to Social Security. And in my opinion, um, that's not an option. 
we should also point out that you have pledged to present uh, and introduce a balanced budget uh, on your first budget that would presumably include the kinds of entitlement reforms you're talking about, not just for Social Security, but also for Medicare, yes, Medicaid, yes. For a significant reduction in military yes, spending, right. all of those things. Yes, You've yes. also talked about eliminating income taxes, um, all income taxes, right? Well, uh, um, look, I am getting elected President of the United States. I am not getting elected king or dictator, so I can't wave a magic wand and do X, Y, or Z. Count on, count on certainty that taxes will not go up, <clears throat> that rules and regulations will only get better, they won't get worse. But if I could wave a magic wand, uh, I would eliminate income tax, uh, I would eliminate corporate tax, because we, do, we would do that, we could abolish the IRS and I would replace all of it with one federal consumption tax. I pose to you, <clears throat> or I present to you the fair tax which is a proposal that has been before Congress for about 10 years. Uh, you've got about 80 congressmen and women that sign on to it every year. Whether or not you agree or disagree with everything regarding the fair tax, it does dot the I's and it crosses the T's on how we would bring about one federal consumption tax. I believe if we had one federal consumption tax in lieu of corporate tax, zero corporate tax, uh, I believe that tens of millions of jobs would get created in this country for no other reason. And let's not kid ourselves. You and I pay for a corporate tax. Uh, one other thing that um, you've talked about doing that you could do conceivably if there's not a change in which party controls both houses of Congress is to repeal Obamacare. So what would you do to replace and, and proceed when it comes to the idea of health care in the United States? Well, uh, no, I would not be able to do that. Uh, that would require congressional action sure, to do sure, that. But, but uh, presumably... W waving a magic support. wand? Well, no, presumably there would be a Republican support. They have opposed the ACA, and have, there have been efforts to repeal it. And if you were elected, um, well, let, that let, would be an opportunity, right? Uh, yes, to to yes. proceed on that policy yes. proposal that you have. So uh, if, if I could wave a magic wand uh, regarding uh, health care, it, it would be to bring competition to health care. It would be a free market approach to health care, which, by the way, health care healthcare is, is as far removed from free market as it possibly could be. In a free market approach to health care, you and I would not have insurance to cover ourselves for ongoing medical need. We would have insurance to cover ourselves for catastrophic injury and illness, and we would pay as you go in a system that would be really competitive. I mean, government could blow the lid off of alternatives to a health care system that deals with the end result uh, as opposed to contracting it in the first place, getting on the prevention side uh, of, what, of, of, of our health care system. But if you had genuine competition in health care, um, I think it would cost about one-fifth of what it currently costs. I, I envision if you had genuine competition in health care, stitches are us, uh, gallbladders are us, x-rays are us at a cost of a third or a fifth of what it currently is. Right now, when you or I go to the doctor's office, we have no idea what it's gonna cost, <clears throat> none. The person at the desk has no idea what, they're, what you're gonna get charged with, and when you get the bill, you know that no one is paying that. So competition in healthcare, advertised pricing coupled with advertised outcomes. You're not gonna go to a gallbladders are us that has an outcome, <clears throat> You're going, to go, you're going to go to the place that has the best outcomes and the lowest price, just like, just like we do uh, in every single aspect of our lives. When you look at uh, drugs, <clears throat> Bill Weld says, well, we can allow ourselves to buy drugs from Canada. He's right. But if we allowed ourselves to buy drugs from Canada, guess how quickly drug prices would drop in this country if we allowed that competition to exist? It, they would drop immediately, they would drop. And the, the EpiPen being a great example of crony capitalism. You know, the FDA refusing to approve a generic equivalence of the EpiPen, uh, and so there's only one producer of the EpiPen. Does it have a basis in somebody having made a political contribution? I'm not saying that it did, but it is government that is limiting 
our choices to, to the EpiPen as opposed to generic equivalents? We'll take two final questions here. Sorry, um, thank you for coming, Gary Johnson, or Governor Johnson, I'm sorry. Um, what, <laughs> um, libertarians have generally not been elected to national office, and my question is, as far as the future of the Libertarian Party goes, whether you see um, the Libertarian Party as outcompeting another party, or whether you would call for structural change, such as like a proportional voting system or something like that, that would allow libertarian ideas and more ideas in general to be voted by various parties. I, I really think that the, uh, that the Republican Party is going to die as a result of this election cycle. I, I really do think that. I think that Donald Trump, <laughs> and I potentially see the Libertarian Party as supplanting, or the Libertarian Party as supplanting the Republican Party, but, but we'll see. Uh, I think moving forward, I think there are going to be a lot more Libertarians on the ballot uh, as a choice going forward. But, like I say, something to watch out for. And right now, from a polling standpoint, uh, libertarians take equally from both sides, uh, Democrats and Republicans. When, you were in, when I was in college, look, if you weren't a Democrat, uh, you didn't have a heart. Um, in later life, if you weren't a Republican, there were those that said you didn't have a brain. Well, you know what? Uh, I think we all have hearts and brains, and I think that's the Libertarian Party. Thank you. This will be our last question. Hi, Governor Johnson. Uh, thank you so much for coming. If you don't win, what do you hope will be the greatest impact of your campaign? That it is the death of the two-party system. Uh, this, is, this is a rigged game. <laughs> Just the math. 28% of Americans say that they're Democrat. 26% of Americans say they're Republican. I'd love to see a poll. Are you going to vote for Johnson or Trump? Are you going to vote for Johnson or Clinton? What would that outcome be? <laughs> Governor Johnson, I want to thank you very much oh, for thank you. visiting thank us you. here at the university. Thank you, thank you for David, your time, David, your thank questions. You. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your excellent questions today. We greatly appreciate you being here. Thank you.